get the book. It is probably the most complete book around aging, brain, brains as they age, artists who've aged well, and she'll take you through that. And Elaine is one of the more creative uh, um, artists and jewelers. She'll talk you, you'll see some of her work as well. I'm actually wearing one of her necklaces. So I'm gonna start, and then we'll talk, we'll talk together, and then there'll be questions for, for you to ask. So uh, Priscilla Long is a Seattle-based writer of science, poetry, creative nonfiction, fiction and history, and a longtime independent teacher of writing. Her most recent book, Holy Magic, Moonpath Press, won the Sally Abiso Poetry Book Award. Her How to Write Guide is the Writer's Portable Mentor, University of New Mexico Press. Her weekly science column, Science Frictions, ran for 92 weeks at the American Scholar Online Edition. She is the recipient of a National Magazine Award for science-oriented piece titled Genome Tome, which appeared in the American Scholar. Her book of memoirist creative nonfiction is Fire and Stone, Where Do We Come From, Where Are We, Where Are We Going, University of Georgia Press. Christopher Hitchens called her first book, A History of Coal Mining, titled Where the Sun Never Shines, quote, an intense and accomplished social history. She is the founding and consulting editor of HistoryLink.org, the free online encyclopedia of Washington State history. So she's going to talk in a moment. Elaine Vogel's unique artwork is guided by unusual materials, creating a body of work that truly qualifies as mixed media. She fabricates one-of-a-kind necklaces she calls unusual adornments. Elaine has collaborated with artists creating art for public sites in Tacoma and Seattle. Solo shows of her work in diverse media have been held at Pacific Lutheran University, the Linda Hodges Gallery in Seattle, the University of Washington Meany Art Gallery, and the Green River Community College Art Gallery. Her work has also been included in numerous group exhibitions at the Washington State Capitol, the Seattle Art Museum, the Bellevue Art Museum, the Foster White Gallery in Seattle, the American Art Company in Tacoma, Face West in Tacoma, and the Tacoma Art Museum. Elaine earned her BA degree from the University of Michigan and her Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Washington. So please welcome Priscilla Long and Elaine Vogel. Come on up. <laughs> Priscilla's going to kick off with talking about her book. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. I cannot see you very well, um, but I see you are out, the, out there. Um, and yeah, and thank you, uh, Rebecca and Elaine, for joining me here. And this is great. Um, so I want to start with a cover. The cover is an artwork by um, a 79-year-old uh, artist. I'm going to tell everybody's age here. So, and after our, we're done, everyone can tell each other their age. Um, named Carol Nelson, and it's called um, Cross Crossroads. And uh, I feel that I wrote the book because I feel I am at a crossroads in that I am turning 80 in five weeks. And so, uh, and I wanted to enter this new era of life in a proactive way and partly, A, to know the science, and there's actually some new science, very important new science in the last very few years. And also, I needed to um, have, I felt I needed to have models of old people who I wanted to be like that when I grew up. So, um, the science, i just uh, list them down. Um, it's to move more, have a passion, connect, and learn. So, um, I will just, let me see if this works. Is this going to work? It doesn't work. Okay, so then I want to go back one. Ah, it worked before. There. Yeah, this is, of course, Twyla Tharp, um, my hero. And um, she, uh, her last book is, um, is called um, Keep It Moving. And um, she said, age is not the enemy. Stagnation is the enemy. Complacency is the enemy. 
Stasis is the, stasis is the enemy. Um, but, and we have to move more, and I have to say that um, if a person is disabled, um, the guideline is to move as much as you can. Um, but anyway, of course, um, she is only 81, so big deal. So this is Don Pellman, and he became the first person older than 100 to run 100 meters in fewer than 27 seconds. And he also has world records in long jump, high jump, discus throw, and pole vault. And so what would this have to do with me and with us? Um, well, um, because I'm probably the world's least uh, uh, athletic person, although I have gotten the memo about moving more. But um, so his goal as an athlete was to uh, break these world records. And he did not say, oh, I'm 100. I am too old to run now. Oh, I'm 100. I am too old to um, jump. And so um, I, and we all, I think, but I translate this into, oh, I'm 79. That's so young, you know, really. Um, I, I'm, I plan, my goal is to write 10 more books. Um, and anyway, about Don Pellman, people say, oh yeah, sure, uh, where's the competition now? I mean, uh. so, however, <laughs> the fact is there is competition. Um, and this is Sister Madonna Booter, who is our own, you know, Washington State um, athlete there. Um, and, uh, This is um, Bessie and Sadie Delani, and their book is fascinating. Uh, they, it's called Having Our Say, and uh, it was on, that when they became centenarians, um, they wrote this memoir about their last hundred years, and it's a, it's a fabulous, have you read it, that book? I mean, it's a fabulous book about middle-class African-Americans over the past 100 years. Um, but uh, staying with moving, they did their exercises every morning, and at age 106, Sadie had this to say about some of her sedentary friends. Um, <clears throat> she said, some of our friends that are 20, 30 years younger come in here and tell me they're worried about me, but to tell you the truth, I think I look better than they do. They come huffing and puffing up the steps, and I'm thinking, I hope you don't die in my parlor. <laughs> and so exercise is important. She says a lot of older people don't exercise at all. And I will add to this my own, uh, there's a lot of statistics in the book, which you can read the book, or some of you have. Um, a lot of young people don't exercise at all, too. Um, and there are so many studies about this, it's becoming completely boring that um, moving more, um, it, you know, significant um, uh, less cardiac stroke and, and dementia. It's just, it goes on and on. One more study and, oh, this is becoming totally boring. Um, and so you might have to, might say, well, what does this have to do with creativity? And the answer is, everything. <laughs> if you play cello, you don't leave it out in the rain. Our bodies, including our brains, are our instrument to create. So there is that. Uh, yep. It doesn't, oh, there we go. Um, so have a passion, uh, creative work that you care about deeply. And I will say, it doesn't mean you have to feel passionate all the time. It doesn't work that way. The work, it's the work that gives you back. Um, so um, I believe that the arts are for everyone. Arts are very, very capacious. And this is Paulus Berenson, um, who um, had that book, um, what was it called? Uh, Finding One's Way in Clay. And it's a book that 
I think it came out in the 1970s and every potter in the universe owns it, I'm sure. But then it started selling outside that market um, and all kinds of people because it's about making art. It's a book about making art. And <clears throat> I want to quote from that. Um, <clears throat> These exercises in the book are concerned acutely with the growing relationship of the potter to his clay, with bringing more and more personality, imagination, and inspiration into play, and with tapping sources deep within the experience of the potter to inform the form he makes. I do not believe it to be a talent that we either have or don't have. We all breathe, we are all alive, we all have unique qualities, yet it takes hard, conscious, and unconscious work for most of us to connect these facts with what we make to find our pot as we also seek our dance and our uh, song. And this is Alma Thomas, a Washington, D.C. artist. Um, and uh, so a lot of the, and she, uh, she had um, two big um, retrospectives in Washington, D.C., which I missed um, in the last couple of years. Um, she died in 1978. Um, but like 15% of the world's people, according to the World Health Organization, she was quite disabled. And I have to say that a number of the um, really world-class creators that are in the book, there are maybe at least 100 um, creators in the book, as well as some other people in other fields, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, were a significant number are, are disabled. And um, so uh, she had, she, she was trained as an artist, but she spent most of her career teaching children, which she loved the children and the children loved her. And that's a very common uh, career pattern. Uh, but um, at 72, she was offered a big retrospective. And she, from then till the end of her life, she worked on her art and she became internationally well known. And in her early 80s, she broke a hip. So what she did then was she would, um, she would, paint with the canvas on her lap. And then in the end, <coughs> excuse me, she would, she had this contraption made where it would hold her up so she could paint big again. Um, and that's what she wanted to do. Um, and she said, she said, do you see this painting? Look at it move. That's energy and I'm the one who put it there. I transform energy with these old limbs of mine. Uh, okay, now this is Wayne Tebow, the California painter, you know, of Wayne Tebow. Um, and he uh, started a new body of work at age 100. I mean, age 98, excuse me, age 98. That's him at age 100. Um, and he, there, it's there, his clown series. It's a wonderful series of work. Um, and he, he said, he said, working becomes your own little Eden. You make this little spot for yourself. You don't have to succeed. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be obligated to anything except that development of the self. And this is Sarah Yerkes, who, um, she was a landscape designer and a sculptor. And in her 90s, she wasn't able to um, to handle the heavy materials that her, her work required uh, any longer. Um, and so she turned to poetry, and that's totally typical that um, the artists um, and, and most artists, they don't quit, they change their medium if they run into a barrier like that. And um, she, I, I, she got into the newspapers because her first book of poems was published after she turned 100. So, um, and the thing is um, that the arts, as well as other fields, 
Um, so you don't have to be in the arts. I mean, there, any endeavor that you, you, you get into involves other people involved in that same endeavor. And so anyway, she said, um, in this poetry workshop I started going to, it was because I liked the people who were in the group. A lot of people in life, as well as at the Ingleside, which was her senior living place, have done so many other different kinds of things, but they haven't been wildly creative. So when a group of potential soulmates turns up, I join them. And um, there's you know, a whole section in the book about connecting to others and um, about the particular problem of old people in that half your friends are, and your, your soulmates and your, your people close to you are, are predeceasing you. And so um, there's, a, there's a lot. And, I mean, um, loneliness, I, I don't think I should get into it here because I don't have time. <laughs> but but um, a, a chronic loneliness is, is very bad for a teenager. It's very bad for a college student, very dangerous. For a 20-year-old, 40-year-old um, just divorced. Um, and it's very bad for old people. And it's very important to... Um, be proactive in making new connections because we're losing, basically we're losing people. And so that's all I'll say about that. Um, and the last thing, which totally blew my mind, if I can make the picture run, come on, go. Yeah, okay. The last piece of science that really was new to me and just totally blew my mind was um, <clears throat> that uh, Rachel Wu is a neuroscientist and her team, and they study um, cognitive um, acuity over the lifetime. And basically, their message is it's not about cognitive maintenance. It's about cognitive development. And they run down um, exactly what that means. And it's, it, it's the same, it works the same for an old person as it does for a child. Um, you have to believe you can learn this. Um, and so learning new things. Um, and their idea is that um, middle-aged people generally are very, um, you know, very busy. Um, the, you know, they're still, they're working a job or two jobs. The kids are maybe teenagers by now. They might be taking care of a parent. They're very, very busy and they're not usually learning much new. Um, and so that's fine. Like, you know, get off my back, right? <laughs> but then things start to change and it's very important to start learning again, very actively. So um, uh, so this is uh, such an example. This is um, Giuseppe Paterno, um, this Italian guy, working class guy, had to leave school in the eighth grade, spent his career um, being a surveyor for the Italian Railroad, and he loved, always loved to read. And at 93, he applied to college, and um, he was accepted. And after a month, he's going, oh my God, these people are so young. <laughs> Do I really belong here? Um, and so he went to a dean and he put it to him and the dean said, yes, you do, you belong here. And he graduated at the top of his class um, in history and philosophy. And I think what he said is really interesting because it really is an index of cognitive development he said, my time at university has changed me for certain. It's as if my brain has evolved. I've started to speak a different language. If I'm discussing the newspaper with my friends, I can articulate myself with greater precision. I'm still the same man. I've been coming up to a century just with a few minor upgrades. And so that's cognitive development. That's that's. And I, I think I want to end my little spiel here with um, Kay Walking Stick, um, because she says this about making art. And so going back to making art. Um, oh, no, sorry. Oh, I forgot one other very important thing. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Um, 
which is Becca Levy's work at the Yale School of Public Health, where she's done, um, she's done longitudinal studies of people all ages 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And um, so a young person with negative attitudes toward their own aging and toward old people ageism has seven years less to live, um, significantly greater um, uh, probability of cardiac stroke and dementia. And so um, that, and it's, this is like, over decades longitudinal studies that show this very consistently. So um, that's why I think there's really, there are two age groups who should read this book, um, and I really do. One is everyone over 40, and the other is everyone under 40. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so you must read it. Um, and then Kay Walking Stick, just to bring it back to the creative work, she says, I think art making is the visual history of our experience on earth, and this is a fuller way to talk about our lives here, our humanity, our existence, our planet. So again, that it's for everybody. Thank you. So Priscilla wasn't kidding when she said she wants to know how old everybody is. I just want you to know you're looking at, uh, at people in about to be 80. That's Priscilla. Elaine is 82. Yes. Yes. And I'm 80. So you got some elders up here, you know. And uh, <laughs> ah, no, and we'll say more about it. Thank you, Priscilla. Elaine's going to talk a little bit about her work, and then we're going to have a conversation, and then you get to ask us questions. And then be brave and tell us, actually, we'll do this. How many of you are in your 80s? Wonderful. How many in the 70s? How many 40 and under? One, good, good. And 60s? So we, yeah, great. Good representation of we're all aging. Just remember oh, that. 90. Do we have some 90s? Wow. And, and you're creating all the time, and being here is creative, so there. Is this on? Uh, okay. But you can use that. I'd like to use this on. Okay. I, I'm uncomfortable with saying I'm going okay. to turn on. Okay, well, here. Okay, is there any chance that these lights can be dimmed a little bit? And... No. No? Okay, let me just light that. Okay. They're oh. videoing, so you need to be back. Should have been. No, I think you emailed it. I emailed it. I emailed it to uh, to Claire. Put it on this to Claire. I can. Is it on the same PowerPoint? No, no it's, it's a separate PowerPoint. PowerPoint. I don't have it. Oh no. All right. You know what? I have it on my computer, and I'm going to get it. <laughs> but I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who should I mail it to? Okay, well, I need, okay. No, no, you let me talk okay. with each other about this table. Well, I'll just, I'll just, how about, how about, oh. I'll just start out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, it's important to have the slides, as you can imagine. But anyway, uh, I, I guess I should say that I've been an artist. Did you hold the oh, microphone up? Oh, yeah. I'm not used to Thank this, you. by the way. Is it? Oh, oh, it's oh, on? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I have, uh, I have been an artist oh. all my life. This one. Uh, 
Don't press anything. Oh, all right. Yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm starting out by saying I've been an artist all my life. And uh, um, when I was in third grade, I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa. And when I was in third grade in an elementary school that went from kindergarten through sixth, um, there was an all-school contest to create a poster of a dog. And I won. And it's like, oh my God. And people came up to me and said, Elaine, you must be an artist. And I went, yes, I'm an artist. I must be, I'm an artist. And that was actually, I mean, I recall that very vividly. And ever since then, I, I have painted, I've drawn, I've uh, worked in, materials have guided me almost all the time. I love to experiment with materials such that um, prior to making jewelry, I was working with encaustic, which is a wax-based medium I was painting with. I've done um, handmade paper sculpture, um, felted sculpture, assemblages, you name it. And uh, my career, I don't know that I mentioned that in my bio, but I taught art uh, as a tenured instructor at Green River Community College for about 20, 25 years, I guess. So anyway, um, about 10 years ago, I have a very good friend uh, who was organizing <coughs> a creative jewelry show. I'm gonna have some water. said, Elaine, I want you to um, make jewelry for this show. And I said, I am just not a jeweler. And she said, what do you mean? You're an artist. You can do it. So I did. And ever since then, I have had more fun making jewelry. That's OK. And one of the things in Priscilla's book that really resonated with me is somebody who said that making art is a, one of the... Yeah. Oh, great, great. That for aging and technology. <laughs> oh, do you see an octopus? Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. All right, great. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Sure. Well, okay, I don't want to block your vision here. Um, you need to put your mic right there. Right there, okay. You can see that I'm not used to this. This is the largest piece I've ever made. I was invited, uh, along with uh, 11 other artists, to make a figurehead sculpture when the um, tall ships came to Tacoma. Anyway, um, I thought to myself, what can I do that would be really fun? Well, the port commissioner of Tacoma came to visit with the group of artists, all of us. And she said, you know, this is gonna be on display in the public, so be respectful. Figureheads usually have big breasts. Don't do it. <laughs> what? <laughs> so you can see that I made an octopus with big boobs <laughs> and covered with paint and glitter, and I had a, I had a uh, a work party with me at one point, uh, adding the PCV bars to make the tentacles. And by the way, the title of this piece is Eight Tentacles Off Course. <laughs> so um, anyway, so I wanted to start with that. But after that, I started making jewelry. And I would say that I'm going to show you some slides there that are in um, categories of uh, creation. First off, just some that are just for fun, like Carnival and the clip art, Hot Lips, uh, Loon, My Flying Pig, Handy Girl, instead of course, Handy Man, Out for a Walk, Going Shopping, Peter Rabbit, you can see Peter Rabbit with his carrot, Romance in the Park, Roost, on the one on the right is a USB hub, actually. Those tulips have, have little inserts that's a hub. And then all dressed up, um, pretty poppy, a uh, acorn surprise, and oh, con concert attire. Then a fancy crab, you can see the claws coming up, crystals, 
uh, first blooms, hummingbird. And then I have, um, I've made necklaces with, I have trays of different themes of objects and different theme-based based, uh, objects. And this one is from uh, my dog objects. <laughs> and love my puppies sniffing the flowers. You can see the dog butt sticking out at you. And uh, woof. Um, and then I've done a whole bunch of bicycle necklaces that are really fun and that people love to buy and wear. Um, bicycle secrets, there's a little locket at the bottom that you can open. The other one, the next one is, dear, have you seen my bicycle? And what, wheeling around. Eat your carrots, this is food. You can see the rabbits. Um, strawberry fondue, there's always room for chocolate. I think that's it, the end of that. So, um, okay. Uh, I don't know time-wise, but I think I have more time. Um, the uh, I don't um, sell online because it's very important to me to have a personal connection with the people who want to buy my necklaces. And what happens usually is that um, women will come up and say, that has my name on it. That just feels like me. And I love to talk with them about my work and my necklaces and you know, just have a, that inner personal connection. Um, uh, occasionally it surprises me what somebody will buy. A very petite woman came up to my display at Rags. Oh, I want to tell you about Rags, Rags Wearable Art. How many of you have ever heard of Rags Wearable Art? No? Oh. Well, once a year in March, and so this is going to happen the week of March 9th, 10th, and 11th of this year, um, the dealership, the Larson Mercedes dealership on I-5 clears out their whole interior and artists uh, come and exhibit their work and uh, sell it for a fundraiser for the YWCA. It's a great fundraiser. It's just really terrific to... It's the, the Larson Mercedes dealership um, right off I-5, in Fife, Fife, yeah, Fife, right. Um, the weekend of March 9th, 10th, 11th, this coming month, next month. So there are ha everything's handmade. There's clothes and purses and uh, lots of jewelry. Everything is handmade. And so a third of our sales goes to the YWCA for the shelter and the promotion of domestic violence and all, you know, really the why. And it's just great fun. It's free, totally open to the public. So if you Google RAGS, capital R-A-G-S, capitalized wearable art, you'll see a lot of information about it. Um, so in reading Priscilla's book, which I really, really was amazed by, it's a terrific amount of information. and and uh, inspiration. Um, the, the, I think I already mentioned that the playfulness has been always important to me. I go into my studio and I just get excited as to you know, what I can play with. And it used to be, when I was younger, that um, I thought, you know, maybe I should become famous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But I should, I should really, you know, and I actually, I, I have actually shown, uh, I've had a piece in the Museum of Contemporary Crafts in New York a long time ago. But over the years I thought, you know, I should up my, I should improve my resume, I should do this, I should do that. And one of the pleasures of getting older is that I don't have to prove anything anymore. I don't have to do it. I don't have to add to my resume. I mean, I can just do what I want. And that's a real joy, and it's actually a real weight off my shoulders, because I, I just get to have fun and not worry about who's gonna, you know, say anything. Actually, I don't know if you can tell, but this necklace here is a clip. It's actually a clip, and I have a pair of little glasses on it and earrings, and you know, it's just this was a fun piece. So. Um, I think that um, for me, oh, one other thing. Priscilla said 
challenge yourself to do something that you know, that you wish you could always do but never had the courage or, you know, the balls to do it. I decided that I, well, I've always thought of myself as having a terrible singing voice, which is, you know, I've always been embarrassed to sing in a group with other people around. And when I've called up a friend to sing happy birthday, I warn them to get out their earplugs <laughs> in advance. Anyway, I decided to take voice lessons. I had my first voice lesson a couple weeks ago, and I have my next one next week. Not that I, my voice has gotten any better yet, but <clears throat> you can hear, uh, it will be. I, I have hope. So I guess that um, part of my nature is to be positive. And um, that's not always easy when things are difficult, but I'm always trying to wake up and be grateful for what, what I have in life. So is that 15 minutes? Yeah. OK, good. Okay. Is that now you can hear me? Great. Well, thank you. So you, you've got an opportunity, <clears throat> a great opportunity. It's why I was so glad to have Elaine come with Priscilla, because we have two people who've worked, who've worked throughout their lives at their art, and, and they're experiencing a new way of being with their art at this age. I just wanted to say that there was a quote that I liked that I wrote down uh, from your book, uh, which is by... Um, it's, it's in Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot's book, and you can talk about that, but she says, uh, it's a quote by a, a, an unquotable older, per, I mean, a non-identified older person. Uh, I'm interested in going slower and deeper, not faster and farther. I want to become wise, not just smart. And I love that. And I just wanna say that before I ask them to talk a bit is, um, because I'm in the aging field, I'm always interested in hearing what people have to say. But this is a very honest look at aging. Priscilla was, was not, it didn't blink in talking about disability, about end of life, the things that we face as we age. But the great opportunity to be creative at any point, to learn new things at any point, and how the more we believe in ourselves, the more creative we are, is wonderful. I think you also address the whole issue of popularity, sales, acceptance, and the business of art, which is not always about good art, it's about business. So um, confronting the studies and the stereotypes, you did a really wonderful job. Great examples of older artists, and I wanna go back in and, uh, and look up some of these artists and find them. So here's the questions that I have for, for Priscilla, first of all. Um, what led you to write the book? Does this work? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, because uh, I was uh, going to turn 80 pretty soon, and I, I really didn't want to just like passively go into to, to my own aging. Um, and um, what was it? I mean, I, I, I see people, I had a few models like Twyla Tharp is my hero, um, although she's not that old, right? Um, but she's 81, so. Um, but um, I, I just needed, I, I needed to have models, uh, uh, I mean, it was a science too, I needed the science, but I needed to have models of old people who were very, who I envied. Uh, when, when I'm 95, I hope to be this way. When I'm 106, I hope to be this way. Um, and so, um, and then I started, I, I got into it, and the more I learned, I mean, there are, probably a hundred, probably a hundred, yeah. you know, different creators. And, and they're not all, cre they're mostly creators because I'm in the arts. I mean, I could have made a book on all athlete, uh, athletes or, or all scientists or all, because, you know, there are these um, amazing elders in every field. But I wanted to know, uh, I, I wanted to know the older um, creators. So the more I got into it, the more, 
kind of changed me. Not that I was in bad shape. Not, for example, not that I um, was terrible at getting exercise, for example. I wasn't terrible. Now I am really good, because I've read the science. Uh, and also, this, the whole thing about learning. I mean, I write a poem every week. I, I, I want to write 10 more books, and I'm in the process of this. But, it, but um, so uh, when I do research, for, I, this, is, this was my thought process. When I do research, like I wrote a piece for HistoryLink.org on salmon in the Pacific Northwest. That was one thing. And then I wrote another piece on writing, which is, was like um, on um, the origin of writing, the Sumerians, the Aztecs, and all that. That was another piece that came out in the Hudson Review. And I was thinking, um, OK, well, those are two very different types of things. But the, the thing is, I'm very good at research. It's kind of the same. It's not so therefore, I decided, OK, um, yeah, I keep doing all that. Uh, definitely, you know, and I believe that productivity is a decision that you make, by the way. That's another thing. But anyway, so I've made that decision um, a long time ago. But um, I thought, no, I need to, um, you know, I'm learning banjo, and I am also, I'm, I'm learning my nemesis, my absolute nemesis. Math. Math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I've reached about the second grade now, and I think that really should have some applause. Thank you. I'm impressed. I can't subtract when people watch me. I can't make change when somebody's watching me, so I'm very impressed. So th thank you for that. Elaine, you just talked about how fun motivates you. I'm, I'm curious, what have you noticed about your work as you've gotten older? Just... Well, <coughs> Use your mic. Use the mic. mic. Oh, there you go. Um, I think that I, um, well, I love to play, and I think that my my a desire to experiment more has has increased, um, and uh, like I mentioned when I was talking before, that I don't have to do. I never accept commissions. And in the past, when I have, it's never been quite what they wanted. So I just say, here it is. If you like it, you can buy it. <laughs> but, you know, just love materials, different kinds of materials. And I love to experiment. And I think that um, what I hope for myself is to continue mm, being grateful for one thing being grateful for what's around me, my loves, my family, friends, and, and being grateful that um, I like to make things and create. And also, I think um, that I, one of the, I used to think, golly, people do very important volunteer work, and what I'm doing is providing uh, necklaces for women, and that's catering to their vanity. But I've changed my opinion about that. Good. Yes, I've decided that I like to encourage people, not just women, but men and women, and my students in the past, to feel good about themselves. I really think that that's something that I'm maybe good at and love to do. And uh, so if a woman buys a necklace, and she feels good about it and makes her feel good about herself, I'm happy. So thank you. And I just want to, I was struck, Priscilla mentioned it before she finished, the studies that show that the more negative our opinions are about, our, about the process of aging, the less likely we are to be creative and to feel good and to stay healthy. Yeah. It affects, it, it's related to dementia, it's related to other general health areas. So. Early on, we get messages about the negativity in our society about ageism is very, very big. We all have uh, internalized ageism. Uh, most people won't, you know, women in particular never, never tell your age. 
and it's just it gets in the way of being of being healthy and being creative. So um, I think this is a great opportunity to learn a lot about aging and creativity in a book that's been so well researched. And I yeah, appreciate it. I also want to just suggest before we ask questions, um, I left a pile of third act magazine, Aging with Confidence, uh, on the book table back there. And that's, those are free. Take them. It's a quarterly that comes out. It's published in the Northwest. And uh, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful magazine. I happen to write for it. But separate from that, it's right. a wonderful magazine. <laughs> I write about food. I write about food, so I do food. She stuff, has great recipes. In I have good <laughs> recipes, I do. Anyway, any questions? We'd love to hear questions. Yeah. You know what, I think you need to come up to the, because they're recording, come up to the mic. Or we can give yeah, them the Yeah, they're, they're streaming this, so there are people um, who are watching yeah. it from some remote. Mic right here. Okay. Oh. I would like to know more about productivity as a decision. Priscilla, you said it, and Elaine, you nodded. So from both of you. About what? I didn't hear. Productivity as, Product. a, deci as a decision. Oh, um, well, I, do you want? You go. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, um, so the sculptor, Louise Nevelson, mm -hmm. who actually we have a sculptor, a, a sculptor of hers in the, in the, um, at Sam, uh, she, uh, I, I read about this a few years ago, um, that she decided to become productive, to be productive. And so I kind of took it on and, and yeah, I think it's like, I mean, there's a lot involved with it. I mean, one is n not to um, be involved in a sporadic work habit, um, but to work every day. It's not about working fast. It's not about working with anxiety. In fact, one of the things I have found, I mean, I just don't write with anxiety anymore uh, at all. I mean, I just do my writing, and that's the way it is. And there's all this talk about the inner critic and all that stuff. And it's like, no. I mean, if I had an inner critic before, which I probably did, it has left on permanent um, it, it aged out. It hmm. aged out, your inner critic. It, it aged yeah. out, right. Um, so, um, but it's, it's just a consistent work habit. Like, I write a poem a week. I mean, it's not a done poem, but I'm, I'm building a body of, I, I think that it helps to build a body of work, to think of your work as a body of work, not just this piece, right? Um, and so, um, and so therefore, and then part of that is keeping track of your work. Are you, what do you do? I'm a writer. Ah, okay. Yeah, and so, um, so I have a list of, in my book, um, The Writer's Portable Mentor, this is all in there, but, um, so I have a list of, of, of course, I have a list of all my publications, but I also have a list of works, which is every piece of work that I've ever brought to type. You know, starting in 1961, I wrote a short story. It's on my list, and I have the short story, and it's like, Okay, <laughs> but it's interesting, you know, autobiographically it's very interesting because it has every theme that I've written about for the next few decades, so it's, even, it's very amateur, you know, but, but um, so I do think that's part of it. And part of it is not, it, it helps you to not work with anxiety. Um, and so, yeah, that's. And I just wanted to interrupt for a moment to say that I've taken Priscilla's class. She's a wonderful teacher and she does teach and you can, go on her website and find out what you're teaching. But that one of the great pieces of permission that I ever got from you was saying, write more than, work on many things. Don't always just do one thing at a time. Yeah. You can have multiple pieces going. And it was very, it gave me permission to not have to feel like, oh, this I have to do this before I do the next thing. And Elaine, you were going to say something about productivity. Well, Put uh, your mic up. My, my. I, I like the idea of um, having the right to fail. <laughs> yes. Give yourself permission to fail. And um, there are many times in my own work where it's terrible. Uh, I just toss it out. But in terms of productivity in my own work, um, I have this big show coming up next month, Rags, <clears throat> and I have something like 45 necklaces. And I don't do them every day, but I get on a roll. And then, I mean, in 
I, I used to, st I used to have um, periods of time where I would stay up all night. I would stay up 24 hours, couldn't stop. I mean, it's just like, oh, the next thing, I can do this, I can do that, you know. And uh, I don't stay up all night long anymore doing that. <laughs> um, but lately, I've been on a roll. So I have a whole bunch of, for instance, bicycle necklaces. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, a question for, for Priscilla. You mentioned all the studies that have been done about exercise and the benefits as we get older. Mm -hmm. What are the three main reasons that people say they don't exercise, not including the fact that they have a disability that prevents them from exercising? What, what's the rationalization for not doing it? What do your studies show? The studies don't really show that. I mean, they, they, they just study, oh, here's 2,000 people. I mean, the federal, here, here are the statistics for the federal gui guidelines. The federal guidelines, as you probably know, you know, it's like walking a half hour a day. It's not, you know, w <laughs> winning like Don Pellman, it's not, no. Um, and it's lifting weights um, and so, and the studies show that the smallest amount of exercise makes a huge amount of difference. And so, okay, so, and, and they just keep coming, they just keep coming, um, the studies. Um, and um, so, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, for one thing, I think people think it means they have to go join a gym and become an athlete and, and do all this stuff that, that's not true. And in, in the book, um, at the end of every chapter, it's, there's a section of uh, sort of, it's like a workbook section composing our lives. And the idea is to change slowly. You don't have to, diets, you know, crash diets don't work. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I find that people who hate to exercise want to change the subject. So they want to go on to something else. Um, and I will say that my mother was probably the most sedentary person. I mean, she was the definition of sedentary. Um, and uh, she just, um, I, I don't have an explanation. I mean, she just couldn't. So when you're that weak, I mean, you can't move. That's one thing. It's hard to move. I mean, you have to start slowly. And it's like if you have a, a, um, a surgery or a hospitalization and you, you lose fitness, like, very quickly. And it's hard, but then you have to slowly, you know, st I, I had a disability, like I broke my leg in 2019. And I was disabled for an entire year. Um, and I like the calf of my leg had no muscle. It was just like a rag um, because I couldn't, I wasn't supposed to move my foot and your calf muscle is what moves your foot. Um, and so it takes time and I think, I think you have to s look at the studies and look at what it means to your life and look at, at uh, and, and it doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean suddenly joining a gym and become, and you know, running, it doesn't mean any of that. Um, so I, yeah, I don't really have an answer why. And the statistics are just atrocious. And they are this, that for people over 65, this is like Centers for Disease Control, and those kinds of, 28% um, uh, of people over 65 meet the federal guidelines, which is like I said, about half an hour walking a day and doing weights. For people under 65, it's 22%. I mean, that is like, un that's just shocking. <laughs> it's just shocking. So. so you know, it's interesting because, because in all the studies that are out there, exercise is the single thing that is most important, but second comes connection with others and and, and also in the list of what's important is a sense of purpose. So you can put those together. You know, if you want to be healthy and creative, find other people to be connected to and exercise. I mean, I think what gets in the way of exercising, 
resistance, feeling unable, it's the weather, it's the, I mean, there's all, think of all the things that keep us from doing what we know is good for us. And then find out how to counteract it by being involved with what's important and with other people. And even a little bit, as you said, even a little bit of walking makes a difference. We have room for one more question if there's somebody else who wants to ask a question, then we need to come to an end. Yeah, you have to. Do the, do the mic thing. Um, all three of you are very inspiring. I'm 52, and I'm wondering what advice you would give your 52-year-old selves, if you could. What, say that again? What advice you would give your 52-year-old selves, if you could go back and give yourselves advice? Mm. Um, I would, uh, I would exercise more. <laughs> That's one thing. Um, I, I, I would, you know, at, at this age, 79, um, I'm just so much better at taking care of myself while taking care of others, you know, taking care of, of, of my own creative work and taking care of my, you know, my, my writers, of which you are one, you know. I mean, I'm just so much better at, um, you know, T today, you know, I've walked my walk, I've done my weights, um, I've, I've worked two hours on my new book, um, um, and I'm just, and, and I vacuumed the house, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean. I <laughs> come, come clean for me. You can. <laughs> and and, and uh, I just, like, when I was 52, my God, you know, I'm amazed that you are doing what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, I worked all the time. I, I, I worked like three jobs or four jobs or, or, or just like I just worked all the time. But, but my house would be a mess. Um, I wouldn't get enough exercise because I figured I didn't have time, which is not true. Um, it's just very interesting. Um, microphone. microphone. Oh, gosh. Uh, at, well, at 52, I was teaching at Green River Community College, but um, I always loved to hear the Italian language and had made, and had gone to Italy. So I decided to learn Italian. And to this day now I can speak Italian because I've kept it up and gone to classes, have a little Italian family of friends. Actually, they're not Italian. They're like me. But we've stayed together, you know. And another thing is I've joined, I've, uh, reached out to friends and joined a book club. And that's a whole other group of people. And then uh, there's another group of people who are artists friends. So Rebecca's point about reaching out to, you know, others and being part of a community of people, I think is really important. And it, and also, Asking for help if you need it. Absolutely. That's a biggie. And, you know, because we tend not to want to do that. But um, we're like, we always want to offer help, but when we need help, we're reluctant to ask for it. That's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. And I would just say um, that, that, that co the concept of, of a sense of purpose, what moves you, what touches you, what makes you yeah. feel... Uh, connected to whatever sense of self you have that 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 feels like it's your it's your desire. Find one, try them. At I had a roommate once. Now, just this is I will end in the, in a moment. But she had a sign on the door that said, "Involvement precedes commitment." And I stood in front of it and I thought, I don't know what this means. I, mean, I had to look at it. And then I thought, all oh, right, don't go buy all the equipment before you know how to ski. I mean, don't, don't assume you're, I mean, I once bought a loom thinking I'd be a weaver because I took two weaving classes. It was a mistake. <laughs> Just leave it at that. But, um, but to find the, th find the things that draw you, try them. See, see where, where are you drawn? Where, is, where are you being pulled? So I think that would be that. Like... Um, learning a new language. Is, uh, where are you from? Um, I, I speak Italian. My father is. 
He's here. He's here for oh, time. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, che bello. <laughs> Well, noi parliamo insieme, va bene. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Elaine and Priscilla, for being here. All the mics went off. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thanks for coming. Yes.